Now, last time we were thinking about the life of David, we were concentrating on that highly dramatic incident, uh, probably one of the most dramatic in the whole of literature, and certainly one of the most unlikely conflicts in the whole of the history of military warfare, when Goliath, the champion giant of the Philistines, was faced with David, the diminutive teenage shepherd boy, Goliath, a kind of walking armory, and David with an almost ludicrous equipment of a sling and five smooth stones. But God was with David, and it turned out, as David foresaw and foretold, that the battle was not to be fought on a human plane. It was the Lord's battle, and the Lord himself brought Goliath down to the dust. And there was great rejoicing in Israel, because the victory for Goliath would have meant a victory for the Philistines and ignominy for Israel, and a victory for Israel and for David would have meant the defeat of the whole nation of the Philistines, and so it was. Now, this evening, we are going to be thinking about yet another clash of titans, Because there is no question that so much of David's life was a life of battle and tension and warfare. As he is created into a man after God's own heart, he was changed into such a man in the toughest possible surroundings. And this particular clash occupies a great deal of this section of 1 Samuel between chapter 18 and chapter 28. It is David the new king, anointed and accredited by God, and yet not crowned as yet by the people. And on the other side, Saul, the old king, rejected by God and discredited not only amongst the people, but within his own family and before his own children, because of his disobedience and rebelliousness against God. Now, David spent a substantial part of his life being hunted and pursued by King Saul. He was the victim of a particularly nasty twist in Saul's character. Saul, who had been his erstwhile patron and his friend, as it seemed, who was his king and his leader. And the twist in Saul's character was a simmering, sick, and sadistic jealousy. You notice how it's summarized for us in 1 Samuel 18, 9, in the last verse we read of that first passage, where Samuel says, from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Now, of course, Scripture is full of warnings about jealousy, as you will know. The Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, a book from which we don't probably quote often or often enough, has this wisdom, love, it says, is as strong as death. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Do you know what that was where that saying came from that we have adopted into our language? Jealousy is as cruel 
as the grave. Song of Solomon 8 and verse 6. The book of Proverbs. Anger is cruel and fury overwhelming. But who can stand before jealousy? Proverbs 27, 4. But it's Shakespeare who has said the thing about jealousy that most of us know, I guess, when in his play Othello he makes Iago say to Othello, O oh, beware jealousy, my Lord, beware jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster. And if you want the quotation, Act 3, Scene 3. <laughs> and just in case you're under any delusions about my knowledge of Shakespeare, I looked it up this afternoon. <laughs> now, by contrast... David shows a very remarkable and godlike generosity to Saul, a magnanimity of spirit which is quite remarkable. We read an example of it this evening that whereas Saul sent his armies against David to seek to kill him, when David has Saul in his hands, he refuses to do so. So this is a study in jealousy and generosity displayed in the lives of Israel's first two kings. We need first, then, a definition of jealousy. What does it mean when 1 Samuel 18, 9 says, From that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David? Well, I think the simplest and least emotive definition of jealousy is that it is a resentment of rivals a resentment of rivals. That immediately helps us, I think, to understand why it is that jealousy can be attributed to God. That not only people like Saul are said to be jealous, but that God Himself is jealous in Exodus 20, when the Ten Commandments are being given from Sinai, God introduces Himself in this way. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now the reason God is a jealous God, and His jealousy is holy rather than sinful, is that God is totally unique. He has no rivals. And we are to produce no rivals to him. You shall have no other gods besides me. And jealousy on God's part is therefore holy. In the same sense, in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians that he yearns over them with a godly jealousy. Now we look at it and say, isn't that a contradiction in terms? Isn't it an extraordinary thing to describe jealousy as a godly thing? But you see, what he is yearning over them for is that there might be no rivals to Christ in their lives. And jealousy is a resentment of rivals. And whether jealousy is godly or sinful depends on whether the rival has any right to be there. Let me say that again. Whether jealousy is godly or sinful depends on whether the rival 
has any right to be there. There is no place for rivals in the context of God's life and relationships. Therefore, jealousy in the part of God is a holy thing. But when you and I make people into rivals and we resent them because they have something we don't have or have gifts we don't possess, then that jealousy becomes a sinful jealousy. And sinful jealousy arises when we resent people when we ought not to do so. For example, Saul appears to have resented David in various different ways. He resented his victory over Goliath, ultimately, although he had once rejoiced in it. He began to resent it because it led to popularity. And Saul resented David's popularity. Let me just show you this in case you think I'm making this up. Uh, Verse 16 of 1 Samuel 18. Verse 15 is the lead-in. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. Saul has slain his thousands, they sang, as they danced in victory along the road. But David is tens of thousands. And immediately, Saul's soul began to burn with jealousy. Do you know that one of the Hebrew words for jealousy is the word to turn deep red? That's beautiful, isn't it? Wonderful language, the Hebrew language, although dreadful to learn. But it's a wonderful language. The idea of jealousy to turn deep red. Now, that's what happens in David's case, you see. He turns red. His blood pressure is probably soaring by this time. Hear what they're crying. Saul slayed his thousands. David is tens of thousands. And the man was becoming successful and popular. Do you ever find yourself resenting people because they're more successful than you? This isn't ancient history, let me say. Do you ever find yourself jealous of people because they're more popular than you? Strange thing is, that Saul began not only to resent but to hate David with a perfect hatred and to fear him. He feared him because he began to represent a threat to Saul. Rather than rejoicing in him as a friend and thanking God for him as a loyal servant as he certainly was, He began to fear him because he saw him as a threat. Now, the extraordinary thing was, of course, that Saul himself had so many things for which to thank God, if you think of it. In stature, we read, he was a bigger man than all his contemporaries. In favor with God, we read in 1 Samuel 10, 9, that God changed his heart and made him a different person and selected him to be king and anointed him, and the Spirit of God rested upon him. In his position, God had made him the first king of Israel. It was God who chose him. And in his family, he was blessed with several obviously unusually gifted children. But in the irrational way jealousy grips people, he became a twisted and cruel and cynical and faithless character in whose life 
cynicism and viciousness and deception began to sour everything. It happens in so many people. I do want to say to you again, this is not ancient history. This is a man of whom 1 Samuel 10 tells us God made him a different person. The Spirit of God rested upon him. God chose him out of the nation for leadership. And at the end of his life, David in his continuing generosity laments his death and says, Saul and Jonathan were lovely in their lives. How are the mighty fallen? And one could have looked at Saul and said, How indeed are the mighty fallen? I have counted ten different occasions when Saul tries to eliminate David in these chapters. Just look at one or two of them with me in your Bible. And notice how jealousy is something that Iago might well have warned Othello against. Because in verse 9, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Beware of jealousy, my Lord, it is a green-eyed monster. And in the very next verse, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp. Now the harp, you know, is, is not that magnificent instrument that you see at an orchestra. It was probably a 3,000 years ago guitar. Most likely, as it seems, in fact, one of the words in Aramaic for a harp is the word from which our European word guitar comes, interestingly enough. But David was playing the harp as he usually did. The reference is to the fact that Saul appears to have suffered from some kind of intense form of nervous disorder. Might have been a headache or something much worse. But what he was in the habit of doing was calling for David when that happened. Music, as you well know, has a therapeutic effect upon people, and it probably was for that reason that he called on him to come and play. Now, I don't think it was Saul's reaction to David's playing when we read Saul had a spear in his hand and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. Now he goes on after this. Almost on every circumstance that arises in his life, what he is out to do is to destroy him. And that is because jealousy inevitably leads to wanting to get rid of the person you resent. You take it into a much less dramatic sphere of the commercial world, where you may be jealous of somebody because of their success and progress, and because you see them as a threat, what's the next thing you want to do? You want to get rid of them. Take it into the professional world. Same thing happens. Now Saul thought up, he applied his mind, he was obviously an able and clever man. And he applied his mind in all kinds of different ways, almost with an obsession to get rid of David. He promised one of his daughters to him in marriage and said, the only thing that you need to do is go out into the battle and fight the Philistines. And he says, it will save me the trouble of uh, 
destroying him, the Philistines will do it for me. And then when Michael, his other daughter, fell in love with David, and his first daughter had not been given to him in marriage, he said, well, now I've got a dowry that I want you to bring to me. And the dowry is that you go out and slay a hundred Philistines. And of course, his whole intention was not that he might attend David and Michael's wedding, but that he might attend David's funeral. His hope was clearly that David would be killed in the process. Look at some of the other evidences. For example, in chapter 23 and verse 7, Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah, and he said, God has handed him over to me, for David has imprisoned himself by entering a town with gates and bars. And Saul called up all his forces for battle to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And again in chapter 24, at verse 1, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. So Saul's whole life was blighted by this dread disease of jealousy. And it became an obsession with him. No wonder Paul warns us against it in Galatians 5 as a work of the flesh. You read through these chapters and you will see the extraordinary way in which Saul became obsessed with his resentment of David as a rival. There was clearly no cruelty at which he would have stopped because of his jealousy. So let me say to you that whenever you see it arising in your heart, you need to take it with enormous seriousness. Not only does Scripture testify to its destructive power, but I can tell you this evening, I have seen Christian men and Christian women who have walked the way of Saul and well nigh been destroyed by jealousy. And one has looked and said, How are the mighty fallen? Now, by contrast, look at David's generosity. Let me just point out to you the two notable occasions when David showed a remarkable magnanimity to Saul. The first is in that same 24th chapter when David is in the desert of En Gedi and Saul and his army have discovered where he is and they are hiding in a cave. You will know that this is part of the terrain of Judea, that it is full of hillsides where there are multitudes of caves. And David and his men were hiding in a cave. You will know that the most famous of them is the cave of Adullam. Well, David and his men in the desert of En Gedi are hiding in a cave. And who should come into the cave but Saul... And David and his, David's men would have immediately killed him. And David said, Do not kill him. Who could kill the Lord's anointed? The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. Do you notice how extraordinary 
is David's generosity of spirit towards Saul. He describes him as the Lord's anointed, as my master. And 24 verse 7, with these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said I will not lift up my hand against my master, because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, for David had cut a piece of his robe off to witness the fact that he had him under his control. He says, see... Look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. Now understand and recognize I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. And when David had finished in verse 16, Saul asked, now, do you see the character weakness of the man? It is an extraordinary thing. Saul was a man of great power, of great integrity, of great moral fiber earlier on. But what he had allowed to happen to him had eroded his character. He speaks to David like some little pussycat. And he says, is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated me badly. And it is an amazing thing, you know, I'm going to be saying in a moment before we finish, that David's great problem, Saul's great problem was that his life was out of sorts with God. And when that happens to a man secretly, something is eaten out of his being spiritually and in terms of his character. And he becomes a path pathetic little weakling. We read the other notable incident in chapter 26. David in the desert at Ziph and Abishai, David's right-hand man, wanted to take his spear when Saul was found in his camp asleep, for the Lord had put a deep sleep on them all. And Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Verse 8 of 26. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. And David said to him, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him. Either this time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and the water jug that are over his head and let us go. And then Saul cried out again in verse 17, Is that your voice, David, my son? And then in verse 21, Now, you'll remember that two chapters before, he has been crying out in exactly the same terms, but he, he hasn't learned a thing. Do you ever find that in your own life? God knows we all do, don't we? But there are some of us who never, ever learn a lesson, no matter how near God brings us 
to some kind of disaster. We never learn lessons. And Saul repeats the same words. Is that your voice, David, my son? And then he acknowledges in verse 21, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have erred greatly. The authorized version, I think, has, I have played the fool. Now, let me just try to summarize by asking, here is a display of jealousy and of generosity. What's the difference between these two men? What's the crucial distinction between them? I don't think you can really say one of them was a believer, the other was an unbeliever. You'd be quite hard put to it to prove that Saul was an unbeliever when we read that God changed him into a different person and gave him another heart and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, however that may be, and there is no final answer to it. The difference between them is not explicable in superficial terms. I think the difference really centers on their attitudes to God. Do you know what spoiled Saul's life? I can tell you very simply. He ignored God's voice. He did it on many occasions right throughout his life after David came on the scene. He did it principally in 1 Samuel 13 where he has gone to meet Samuel at Gilgal, and after the Philistines had been dealt with, God had told him, wait seven days till Samuel comes. And the point about this was that God had anointed Samuel as the priest who was going to offer offerings to God. Now Saul was a king, and Saul was a prophet, but Saul was not a priest. And that mattered enormously in the Old Testament economy. And Saul came and waited, and Samuel didn't turn up immediately. But God had said, wait for seven days. And Saul said to himself, I'm going to do it my way. What's the point in waiting for this old buffer who's not going to turn up anyway? I'll do it my way. And he offered the sacrifice himself. And Samuel arrived. And he said, you acted foolishly. Chapter 13, verse 13. You have not kept the commandment the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. And again, after he fought with the Amalekites, the story is in 1 Samuel 15. Do you remember... Uh, Saul had been commanded by God that he was to fight with the Amalekites with a particular result that he would take the battle to the very ultimate place. But instead of doing that, he brought back some of the choicest cattle for his own use and for the use of his men. And uh, while Samuel came... Samuel said to him, have you done as the Lord wanted? Now, here is another trait in Saul's character. He lied. He was a liar to his back teeth in these days. And he said, yes, I have done what the Lord commanded. I have obeyed the Lord. I have performed his will. And Samuel said, could you explain the bleating of the sheep to me then, please? Oh, the bleating of the sheep, said Samuel, said Saul. 
Well, uh, that really was nothing to do with me. Uh, that was because we wanted to get some sacrifices to give to the Lord. That's why. Thinking it up as he went along, you know. We wanted to give them to the Lord, he said. Do you understand? We're highly spiritual men here, you know. And Samuel said to him, to obey is better than sacrifice and obedience than the fat of lambs. And what God is interested in is obedience. Now, what we read is that the Lord came upon David, and the Lord was with David, but the Lord had departed from Saul. And that's an appalling thing, isn't it? On you go, he was saying to Saul, do your work, fight your battles, gain all you can, but the hand of God is off your life. And the evidence of it was his jealousy of David. What about David's attitude to God? Well, you know, many of the Psalms are written from this period, and you can tell in Psalms like Psalm 59 and 63 and many others, that David's great concern at this time is that he should walk with God and find his confidence in God and find his hope in God. He had no high pretensions about his own status. He had no great ambitions for himself. Even when Saul said to him, you can become my son-in-law, 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 he said, who am I? that I should be the king's son-in-law. All he wanted to be was the servant of the Lord. Now, David, as you and I well know, and we will be discovering soon, David is, uh, David is not the perfect man of God. He had the profoundest flaws but the thing he had set his heart on, failure notwithstanding, was pleasing God and being a man after the Lord's own heart. And I want to say to you that when that relationship is right, every other relationship in life gets right too. That's the amazing thing. You relate to people who have all the gifts you don't have and all the success you've never gained and so on. You relate to them properly when you relate to God properly because the Lord becomes your portion. The Lord becomes your joy. The Lord becomes your riches and pleasing Him is more important than anything else in the world. And overall, that was David's great lifestyle. Do you begin ever to see some of the evidences of Saul's disasters in your life? Well, you need to heed the words of Iago to Othello. Beware jealousy, my lord, it is the green-eyed monster. Or more important, you need to heed the example of Saul and David. And above all else, you need to discover through David great David's greater son of whom we were singing at the beginning, who has dealt with us in a generosity of grace that enables us no matter what we have been, no matter how far we have fallen, to be embraced in the matchless love of Jesus Christ. 
so that we are made new people with a new heart by him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we cry to you this evening that you would help us heed the warning of Saul and the example of David, that our lives may be marked by that generous grace and that loving forgiveness that David knew. Hear us as we pray that we may especially find it in Christ who sprang from David and grant that in him we may be made beautiful in our character with the beauty of Jesus. We ask it for his name's sake. Amen.